Hi, my name is Liam, and today I am joined by my peers, Elaine, Aaron, and Amy, to present to you our documentary project for social benefit as part of our capstone course. Our project, Under the Sea, is a documentary that seeks to address the deteriorating health of our oceans and marine life as a result of pollution. We chose this topic as ocean pollution is a worldwide environmental issue that is increasingly worsening despite the amount of research that has warned every population about how detrimental actions will leave a permanent and irreversible effect. In presenting this documentary to the public, our goal and purpose is to increase the generational awareness surrounding the importance of protecting and preserving our precious ecosystem and encouraging our community to consider every small action that they take and understanding its impact. With the ocean covering up more than 70% of our planet, it is the largest ecosystem and a valuable natural resource that is currently endangered, part of which is due to pollution. Ocean pollution is an issue that became apparent in the 1960s. After conducting various researches on plastic litter during this time, scientists noted occurrences of bird species ingesting plastic items and seals were getting trapped in netting. By the 1970s, it was realised that plastic is not biodegradable and instead, it breaks up into smaller and tinier pieces of its original form, also known as microplastic. Marine life ingest and absorb these microplastics and in the circle of life, humans catch and eat these species which can begin to have a detrimental effect on our health. However, despite having this crucial information, the production of plastic did not stop growing and recycling strategies were developed and individuals were informed on how to consume plastic wisely instead of reducing the production of plastic overall. Today, our oceans are experiencing a plastic crisis. Individuals are incorporating plastic into their everyday lives due to its convenience and durability and they lack the long-term thought of how plastic will remain in our environment for decades due to its inability to biodegrade. According to the Natural Resources Defence Council, also known as the NRDC, 300 million tonnes of plastic is produced every year worldwide, half of which is for single-use items only. In 2021 alone, more than 17 million metric tonnes of plastic entered into our oceans, and these figures are projected to double or triple by 2040, according to the United Nations. In an effort to prevent plastic waste, Reducing the use of plastic is the most effective means and recycling it more frequently will reduce its footprint. But unfortunately, 91% of all plastic is not recycled at all and it ends up in landfill or in the environment. With this persistent and addictive behaviour of using plastic without discarding it correctly, our waters are suffering the most and it is also having a negative impact on the climate. As such, it is important to understand the significant causes and effects to understand the problem at a deeper level in order to act appropriately to save our ocean's health. Pollution has a detrimental effect on our marine environment as it threatens ocean health, the health of marine species, food safety and quality, human health and contributes to climate change. After landfill pollution enters the ocean through waterways, many marine animals confuse the pollution as food and so ingest the plastics most of them die of starvation as their stomach becomes filled with plastics. Fish that ingest plastic are at risk of intestinal injury and death. This transfers plastics up the food chain into bigger fish and marine mammals. Sea turtles can also mistake floating pollution as food and can choke and sustain internal injury or die. A study found plastic in the guts of 90% of the seabirds and 100% of the turtles tested. Seabirds are also one of the main marine animals that ingest the polluted plastic. It is estimated that 60% of our seabirds have eaten plastic. At these current rates, plastic is expected to outweigh all the fish in the sea by 2050. 
Not only is this polluted plastic killing millions of marine mammals due to ingestion or entanglement by the plastic debris, but it is also contaminating seafood that humans consume. Chemicals used in plastic can be carcinogenic and can interfere with the body's endocrine system that may affect developmental, reproductive, neurological and immune disorders in both humans and wildlife. Plastic waste in the ocean can also make coral more vulnerable to fatal diseases. A study found that some types of coral are more likely to be impacted than others due to their physical structure. The larger coral were found to be eight times more likely to trap plastics. This can have a detrimental effect on the juvenile marine life that uses their structure as refuge and nurseries. Plastic also contributes to the issue of climate change as when destroyed, it emits carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, therefore increasing emissions. Overall, plastic has a detrimental effect on ocean health and impacts marine creatures including fish, seabirds, turtles and larger mammals and coral health. It has also been found in seafood that humans ingest and is a contributor to climate change. We were joined by Pip Kiernan from Clean Up Australia and Heidi Tate from Tangaroa Blue to provide us with some information about their organisations and their viewpoints on this issue. So Pip, if it's okay, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself, your current position and what inspired you to take this role? Yeah, so I'm Pip Kiernan, the chairman of Clean Up Australia and the charity was started over 33 years ago by my father, Ian Kiernan. Uh, so Dad was a solo yachtsman and a builder, and he was participating in a solo race around the world um, in 1987. And during that race, uh, it had an enormous impact on him and what he then went on to do for the rest of his life. Um, so he was in a place called the Sargasso Sea, which is meant to be one of the most incredible, pristine parts of the world. He was so excited about seeing it. But when Dad got there, uh, he was absolutely horrified by the amount of pollution. Predominantly, this litter was plastic and, you know, toothbrushes, shoes. Uh, it, it was just horrific and man-made impact on our beautiful planet. And Dad came home. He, he just couldn't really get over what he'd seen there. And being a very practical person, you know, he's a builder, um, he decided to do something that really tapped into the power of the community and he came back and started Clean Up Sydney Harbour and the first one was in 1989 and he was hoping that people would turn up and 40,000 Sydney siders turned up for that first event, um, you know, with their rakes and gloves and, and gum boots and got in there because he tapped into this huge sentiment of wanting to to make a difference and really do something practical for the environment. And so 33 years on, the charity is, is still, you know, a really strong, relevant organisation because it taps into that power of the community. It gives a way for communities to come together and do something very practical in their own way. Uh, and so after that first Clean Up Sydney Harbour in 1989, it became a national event. So Clean Up Australia Day was born uh, and it's gone on from strength to strength. So today we're joined by Heidi Tate, the CEO of Tangaroa Blue. Um, could you please tell us about yourself and your role in the organisation? Well, thanks for inviting me to chat with you guys today. Um, so I am the founder as well as the CEO and um, after working for 20 years almost as a scuba diving instructor um, I've seen a lot of what happens in our oceans and the impact that humans have on it and I guess that that's where our focus or my focus on marine debris and plastic pollution kind of started. I was um, managing a dive shop in the southwest corner of Western Australia in a beautiful place called Margaret River um, and just couldn't believe the amount of rubbish that we're seeing washing up um, on the coastline there, particularly in national parks and the wide variety of sources. So international staff, local litter, um, commercial fisheries. Um, and that really said to me, hey, there's not one problem. There's not one solution. We really need to figure out exactly why this stuff is washing up and from where um, if we're going to start to propose solutions that'll, that'll actually work. So. I uh, started a small community group that, that did a, a couple of cleanups there and, and data collection to try and understand the sources. Um, and 18 years later, we have a, a national charity uh, and a national program called the Australian Marine Debris Initiative. 
um, and a big database that's helping guide those discussions at a national and an international scale now. Could you please tell us more about Clean Up Australia and what it aims to achieve, even though I feel like you dabbled in about that in your previous answer, but could you just explain a little bit more about what it aims to achieve? What do you think this company would look like in the next 10 years? Um, are there any other goals that you would like to achieve in running Clean yeah. Up Australia? So Clean Up Australia is a charity. So um, we are, you know, we are a not-for-profit organisation. And my father always used to say, Clean Up Australia belongs to the community. And we're very true to that. You know, we really are there to support the community. We empower the community to choose where they want to clean up. So we just give them the tools to do that. So we provide the free kit materials, the gloves and the bags and, and the instructions you need to safely run your clean up. And we provide those materials free to um, schools across the country and members of the community. Uh, but as I covered earlier, we're very much about prevention. So we work with schools in, in helping to educate our young people who are our future um, about what we can all do to help better protect the planet. Um, we also are a source of information for general members of the community, for media, um, for businesses around particular waste challenges and helping to um, highlight those and how, how we can do things better. I guess to answer your question about what the future looks like for Clean Up Australia, you know, we'll always be that community-led grassroots organisation, but our, our influence in prevention is very important. You know, we work with businesses and we work with government around doing things better and creating a better future for all Australians and, and taking better care of this incredible um, asset we have. It's it's the most important asset we have. If we don't have a beautiful in, and pure environment, it affects all of us. So can you just tell us a bit more specifically about Tango Blue and the organisation's vision, mission and and the goals it aims to achieve? So I guess the, the easiest way to encamp encapsulate everything we do is is by my mantra which is if all we do is clean up that's all we're going to ever do so if you're going to tackle a massive um, issue like marine debris that has so many sources um, you need to really understand the issue and understand at what point items become lost into the environment um, and then when you understand that then you can figure out what needs to change um, and what we've seen with the the database and the data is that regionally around Australia, the marine debris signature is very, very different. So if you um, have a look at what we find on the beaches in Cape York, it's completely different to what we find to the beaches in St Kilda. Um, and so there's not going to be one solution. So Tangaroa Blue was about creating a holistic framework, which is what we call the Australian Marine Debris Initiative, that includes all the things that we think needs to happen to actually remove and prevent uh, marine debris uh, and it can be scaled to an international um, scale as well as working as really um, a local community effort as well so that that was really what we we wanted to develop we work with you know over 2,000 partner organizations from local community groups to government agencies to universities um, to industry bodies and when we look at the technicalities around solutions we need this expertise it can't be left to the conservation sector so we wanted to be that that middle conju um, conduit, um, you know, that hub where we could bring everybody together. Now, we work with lots of industry partners. We don't necessarily agree with everything that they do. But when we work at this one table, we have a, a common goal and we all agree that plastic and marine debris shouldn't be in the ocean. So that's what we're working on. And if we can find ways to prevent that by changing something in industry or changing a government legislation or education and awareness, um, and then we have a way to measure the impact, obviously, through data as well, then we know that we're slowly shifting the behaviour that we need to shift to prevent it in the future. Um, so since the launching of Clean Up Australia and the Clean Up Days that you have annually, could you tell us a little bit about the findings a little bit more in depth? So what does like the statistics look like? Has it improved? Um, you just mentioned that cigarette, cigarette butts are like one of the main culprits of like littering, like has that number decreased since you started working in Clean Up Australia? Like what does it look like at the moment? Yeah, so we see, we produce what's called a rubbish report every year. So 
Um, the annual rubbish report is a snapshot of what our volunteers have collected in their efforts through the year. And that's really interesting to see how that's changed over time. Um, and what we've seen, sadly, is year on year, the amount of plastics that our volunteers are collecting has grown. And, and that tends to be predominantly plastic packaging. Uh, so while, you know, in those early days, particularly with Clean Up Sydney Harbour and, and those earlier clean up events, it tended to be the bulkier items that volunteers were pulling out. Now it tends to be the smaller, lighter stuff, the plastic. So and that's reflective of our of our consumption. So, you know, a million tonnes of our annual plastic consumption is single use plastic. Uh, and 70 billion pieces of soft scrunchable plastics are used in Australia every year. So when you think about that statistic, it's not really surprising that, um, you know, half of, this, of all the items that our volunteers collected last year were plastic or contained plastic. So when you say soft scrunchable plastic, you're talking about like plastic bags, right? Like plastic I'm talking packaging. about... Yeah, I'm talking about any plastic that you can scrunch in your hand. So it's yep. bread bags, it's um, confectionery wrappers, chip packets, mm -hmm. uh, plastic bags, that sort of item. And they are recyclable. Our recycling rates of those are very low um, yep. in Australia at the moment, but you can recycle them. They can be uh, returned to a red cycle bin at, at your supermarket and they can be um, turned into new products. How's marine debris? with one of the main culprits being plastic um, impacted our ocean's health. When we first started back in 2004, um, and a little bit of research that was out there, kind of had numbers around 6 million tonnes of rubbish entering the environment every year, you know, or into the oceans every year. There was something like 270 odd species that were being impacted um, by plastics in our ocean. Now, if we fast track to today, those numbers are around 11 to 13 million tonnes, so they've, they've doubled since 2004. And we're looking at over 800 species being impacted. Now, it's not that those species necessarily weren't being impacted in 2004, it's just we didn't know about it. So this research is creating a lot more understanding of these impacts. So um, pretty much every species on the planet can be impacted by litter, by plastics and by marine debris. And in particular, because of plastics, um, in the environment, they, they never go away, you know, they fragment, they break up into smaller and smaller pieces and the smaller a piece of plastic, the more potential species can be impacted by it, including humans could either inhale it or ingest it. So I, I think that our awareness around this is becoming much more um, and people are now becoming aware of what's happening in parts of the, the planet that they can't see. We know that animals can ingest it, they can get entangled in it, we know that it can um, uh, disrupt navigation with boats hitting, you know, and uh, wrapping around the props. We know that, you know, pre-COVID people didn't want to go to Bali and swim with plastic bags. You know, it was impacting tourism and fisheries. Um, the big question that really still hasn't been answered yet is how does it impact human health? And we're still waiting for that question to be answered. And I guess um, when we know that so many of the chemicals that are in plastics are endocrine disruptors um, and these toxins and chemicals can leach into the tissues of the animals that actually eat it and then the, these chemicals can bioaccumulate up the food chain and guess who's at the top of the food chain? It only makes sense that these chemicals will have an impact on human health into the future. As, as you said, and I'm sure we're all aware that plastic is probably the biggest culprit when it comes to ocean debris but do you see trends in any other type of litter when when analyzing this this debris that's in our oceans yeah we do um and they and again you find them in different areas so one of the things that we're really working on at the moment is um on a, a rubber material so in australia we dispose of about 48 million car tires a year or truck tires a year um, that come to their end of life. And the government has been trying to figure out, so what do we do with these? There's a product that they've been developing called rubber crumb. So they shred the tires and then they compact the crumb and then they put it on the kids' playgrounds. But what we've been finding is that this rubber crumb is now starting to release out of these playgrounds. And in some cases, only within a matter of weeks after the playground surface has actually been laid. So it's not a really good use of this product. It's not fit for purpose. But we know that these um, these tire crumbs actually have over 307 chemicals in them, and the mo majority of them are carcinogenic. So we're opening them up, we're increasing the surface area by shredding them, and then we're getting our kids to go and play in them. 
Um, now the bits that are coming off are now entering the environment. And so we're starting to even find um, pieces of this rubber crumb on the beaches um, and along the waterways near parks that are washing off during, during rain. And so we're trying to provide feedback back to the government, back to the Tired Stewardship Australia to say, hey, we don't want to be using tyres for this purpose. It's not fit for purpose. And we now have data to, to prove that as well. Yeah. And just another question touching on that as well. Um, a lot of companies are trying to move towards a sustainability route. So switching out their one time use plastics for, you know, like paper straws, paper, like utensils, like wooden utensils and whatnot. Um, would you be able to know whether or not that has improved because like improved the rate of lowering the litter? Obviously, you just said that there's actually, unfortunately more plastic that volunteers have actually been able to yeah. pick up. But um, with the efforts that the organisations are sort of putting in to, you know, switch out that one time use plastic, mm -hmm. do you think that there is potential for that plastic rate to decrease at all? It absolutely has an impact. So what we've seen in Australia um, over the last couple of years is the phase out of problematic and single use plastic items across most states and territories. So that's happened at a different rate. So some states and territories are further ahead than others. Um, but we do know that once you know, in in New South Wales, for instance, it's a bit early to see the impact of that because that's just come into, into fruition. But we do know that it will have a flow on effect. So the phase out of plastic bags, um, lightweight plastic bags, for instance, we know in the states and territories where that has been phased out for longer, that less of those items are found as litter by our volunteers. And the same rings true for um, what's called the container deposit scheme in Australia. So now the whole um, nation has a container deposit scheme. Every state and territory has that. It's just about to come into, it's been accepted as law in Tasmania and Victoria, yet to be implemented. But um, in states like South Australia, that's been in place for nearly, I think over 50 years. And we know from the data of our volunteers that very few containers are collected as litter in those locations where a container deposit scheme is in place. And what that scheme does, it's a 10 cent refund scheme. So it means those yeah. drink containers, like a can of oh, yeah. um, soft drink or a um, bottle of beer, those containers can be re returned for a 10 cent refund to the consumer. What major actions will have the biggest impact on minimising debris? like? Uh, eliminating plastic bags, more biodegradable products, um, on the likes of those. So I think that we're leading into probably the, the best opportunity to have an impact on this issue right now. Because earlier this year, in the United Nations uh, Environment Assembly, they actually passed a resolution to create a legally binding treaty on plastic pollution. So this is massive because it's going to be legally binding and every single uh, country that signed up to the UN will have to adopt it. So we, we have an opportunity here. The opportunity though needs to be implemented correctly um, and it's going to be fast tracked as well. So they want it in by the end of 2024, which is, is, is unheard of. So we can see this urgency around needing to act. Now, what do we need to see is we need to see um, the same kind of outcomes across the world. And we need to acknowledge that some countries like Australia should have better waste management infrastructure than some third world countries. So those third world countries need support in lifting up how they're, they're using um, or disposing of their waste. So there's, there's one thing in waste disposal management that needs to be really addressed. And that will stop the leakage of waste into the environment. But we also need to be tackling it at the other end. And that's in the design phase. And we need to be looking at products that don't need to be made out of plastics not made out of plastics um, and, and that, that's key. So plastic is an amazing material, um, but we don't need to be using it for things that we're going to use for five seconds and then, and then throw out. So we need to really, really shift our, our design phase and we need to really consider around circular economy principles um, that whatever we make into something can then be made back into that product. And circular economy, unfortunately, is now becoming a little bit of a buzzword. It was like sustainability back in the 80s. It was this new word and now nobody knows actually what it means, but everybody uses it to try and prove something that they're doing. And the circular economy model, and I, I, I urge you to have a look at this. It used to be the triangle, right? That used to, or the circle that used to go around and it used to keep going round and round. 
but somewhere along the line, there's an arrow that's been added to it that pops out. And that's this, this loss. And so I, I would say it's not a circular economy anymore. It's an almost circular economy. But when did that become acceptable? Because now we've just downgraded the outcome. So we've, we've accepted a lesser standard of what we were trying to achieve in the first place. So we, we need to bring that back and understand how do we actually design for true circular economy? How do we minimize waste in that design phase and not be using plastics for things that we don't need to? And we need to make sure that the products that we do make out of plastic don't end up in the environment through proper waste management. We need to do that at an international scale. Just lastly, um, we just wanted to ask, moving forward, what can we do as a society to help continue your legacy of Clean Up Australia? Is there anything you want to leave and summarise? <laughs> yeah, look, get involved. It's, it's really easy to get involved with Clean Up Australia. You just go to our website at cleanup.org.au. Um, there's so many different ways to get involved. You can register a Clean Up um, any time of the year. You can donate to the organisation. You can look at many ways that you can reduce your impact um, as a consumer. We've got lots of tips from, you know, fast fashion um, to, you know, buying carefully and avoiding certain plastics and, and litter. Um, you know, there's some top tips I like to share as well that yes, I think please. You know, we, we talk at Clean Up, we, we try and demystify and simplify um, things so that because it can become overwhelming. You know, people think, oh, what, how can what I do have any impact when we're creating so much waste? It absolutely can have an impact. And, and you can send very strong messages in terms of um, what you buy and the products you support and, and what you avoid. Um, so some tips, I guess, you know, avoid single use items wherever you can. A avoiding and reducing is, is um, you know, the greatest impact we can have um, and being more mindful about what we do buy and, and looking at, you know, more responsible brands. So um, buying recycled content wherever we can that is also recyclable. Um, so really looking at the packaging, there's some good um, guidance. There's, we have in Australia something called the Australian Recycling Label. That's not mandatory, but it is on increasingly on more and more products and packaging. And that will guide you in terms of whether the item is recyclable and what you do with it. Does it go, you know, do you have to separate items like the lid of the, um, you know, the nozzle, the pre-wash spray nozzle, does that need to go in the general litter? whereas the bottle goes in the recycling, the, the ARL will give you that guidance. There's also another great um, tool, which is again a free, it's a free app and it's called RecycleMate. Um, and it uses artificial intelligence to identify your um, litter and recyclables and find the best way that you can dispose of those. So, you know, the more we can all recycle, the more we can be part of that solution. But also back to avoidance, you know, taking your reusable shopping bag when you go shopping, taking your reusable water bottle, um, saying no to the single use coffee, taking your, your reusable coffee cup, um, you know, and buying, you know, when it comes to fashion, looking at items that, you know, can I buy um, recycled, can I rent? Um, can I buy items that are likely to last and be able to be repaired and, and reused and have, have a greater life? You know, most Australians don't know the term circular economy, but once it's explained, everyone gets it. And, and that idea is really around creating products and packaging with its end of life in mind so that you're not make, use, dispose a linear approach it's a circular approach so you design the product from the outset to be captured at the end of its life and to be turned into something new um, so after it's had a long life of repair and reuse how do we capture those resources and rather than pulling new resources out of the ground to make new how do we use what we've already got so all these little things and little lifestyle changes can have a huge impact when we all collectively do that. And we, we have a quote that we love to use um, at Clean Up Australia that we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. If we if we can all do our bit, you know, that can have a huge collective impact to to lighten our footprint on the earth. Yeah. What can we do as a society, as individuals, to help the oceans really help, you know, improve ocean health and reduce debris? 
Well, I, I think the I think number one is don't get overwhelmed, right? This is a massive issue. And if you try and change the world overnight, you, you just kind of get in this place of despair. So it, it's about identifying what we can do um, and don't feel like it all has to be done overnight. So, you know, have a look at your own homes and, and look at how you consume um, and shift the, the question to um, do I do I need this um, from do I want this? Right. And if we, we start, you know, consuming things that we actually need and not just because someone tells you that you need the latest iPhone, even though there's nothing wrong with the other four that you've got in your, your you know, your top drawer, we start to reduce consumption. And when we start to reduce consumption, it has flow on effects to not only marine debris and waste management, but to climate change as well. And transition slowly, like pick one thing that you're going to go, you know what, I'm going to always make sure I have a reusable water bottle with me and I'm going to refill it every day. And that's the thing that I'm going to do every day for the next, you know, four weeks or six weeks. And when I've got that down wide, then I'll move on to the next thing. And then the other thing I would say is be a role model, right? It's surprising how many people watch you and in your networks. And then the third thing I would say is become aware, be smart. Just because something's on Facebook, just because something's on social media or on the news, it doesn't make it true. We need people to do the research as well to make sure that when they think they're buying something because it sounds environmentally friendly, that it actually is. Well, thank you so much for having this interview with us today, Pip. Um, do, is there any other final words that you would like to let our viewers know? No, it's been great talking to you and, and well done with your project. I love what you've chosen to do. And yeah, it's been a real pleasure chatting to you about the work Cleanup does. And it's, yeah, nice to meet thank you both. You. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Heidi, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today just to provide us some information on Tangaroa Blue and some insight into our ocean's health. Um, we really appreciate you joining us. And it's great to see not only organisations acting on this issue, but also people like yourself and those from our local communities who, you know, are so passionate about our ocean health and determined to to make a difference. Thanks so much for the chat. And anytime you want to come out on the beach, just let us know. As a group, we wanted to create an impact of our own and showcase what can be done on a smaller scale to help prevent ocean pollution. Our way of helping the cause was to organise a day that was dedicated to picking up as much rubbish as possible at the Alterna Beach. Our goal on the day was to pick up enough rubbish to fill your standard rubbish bag. We were able to achieve this goal, however we were pleasantly surprised how little rubbish there was. Reflecting upon our visit to Altona Beach, it was apparent that the council has implemented strategies to minimise rubbish on the beach. A strategy that stood out to us was the number of bins. There seemed to be a bin located every 20 metres. Although the Altona beach was relatively clean, we understand that not all beaches are quite the same. Through our interviews with Tangaroa Blue and Clean Up Australia, there was a common message. This message was focused around stopping plastic use at the source. The focus on stopping rubbish at the source is important because picking up rubbish is great However, it is a short-term outcome. Picking up rubbish is only useful until the next person walks on the beach and litters, or the next tide. As Heidi from Tangaroa Blue said, if all we are going to do is clean up, that's all we are ever going to do. Highlighting the importance of a solution at the source and design phase. A more holistic preventative measure is at the beginning of 2022, the United Nations Environments Assembly created a legally binding treaty on plastic pollution. The treaty has created an opportunity to tackle the issue of plastic pollution. The United Nations are aiming to complete a draft legally binding agreement by the end of 2024. This time frame demonstrates a sense of urgency surrounding a solution to eliminate plastic pollution from our oceans. How can we at home help prevent and tackle plastic pollution? Firstly, we need to look at our own homes and see how we consume. We need to look at the things that we need instead of want. For example, we may want the new iPhone, even though our current iPhone works perfectly fine. This constant need to upgrade only creates more waste. Secondly, in order to become more environmentally friendly, we should slowly change our behavior by picking one thing we're going to change. 
For example, you may choose to use a reusable water bottle every day. Once this has become a habit, you can move on to the next thing. If you decide to change everything overnight, it will become overwhelming and it won't work and you will fall back into old habits. The third thing we can do is to be a role model. People will notice changes in your behaviour, such as picking up rubbish, even if it's not yours, or even using reusable shopping bags instead of the plastic ones. When we conducted our cleanup day, we had multiple people notice us and come up to us to talk about what we were doing. We even had a little kid join us in picking up some rubbish. This just shows that you can be a positive role model by showing them what they can do to help minimise their environmental impact. If we continue to use plastic and pollute the oceans the way we currently are, more and more species of wildlife will be impacted, including humans. Heidi noted that when Tangaroa Blue first started in 2004, it was estimated that 270 species had been impacted by plastic. If we fast track to today, it is estimated that over 800 species have been impacted by plastic pollution. Therefore, as we progress in time, more and more species of wildlife will be affected if we don't change the way we live. Ultimately, it is likely that it will come back to us humans as the toxins and chemicals that plastic possesses can leach into the tissues of the animals that eat these plastics. The chemicals can accumulate up the food chain to us humans at the top. It is likely that the chemicals in the plastic will impact human health in the future, making it ironic that these health problems began with our poor waste behaviours. We would like to take a moment to thank you all for watching our documentary and hope that it leaves a positive impact on the community. We would also like to give a special thanks to Heidi Tate from Tangaroa Blue Foundation and Pip Kiernan from Clean Up Australia for taking the time out of their busy schedules to participate in the making of this documentary. Additionally, we would like to also express our gratitude to the organisations who were interested in collaborating with our team, namely Beach Patrol Australia, The Nature Conservancy, Ocean Watch Australia, Earth Watch Australia, and Plastic Oceans. We would like to invite you to provide us some feedback about our documentary through the following. Thank you for watching.